All right, take it away. Thanks, Nick. Afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for, for joining in on this, this bat team. This is a pretty awesome program. Um, I know many of you um, are familiar faces and you're probably darn familiar with this program, but um, as Nick mentioned a minute ago, I am a TU staff. I do get to live the dream and get paid to do some of this stuff. But I really want to say thank you to all of you, uh, try to limited members and volunteers. Um, I think together we make one to you, we make to you what it is and all the success it's been across the country. So I really, really mean that. And, um, I look forward to meeting a couple new faces tomorrow. I, uh, I live in Olympia. I'm a project manager. Um, so I manage restoration projects, including some barrier correction projects. Um, the program is growing, but a lot of the work lately has been with these barriers and we can talk about that. We're going to dive right in today to the level a assessment. That's generally the first step in assessing a barrier. And sometimes that's enough. That's all we need to do is a level a to identify whether or not a particular culvert or road stream crossing is a barrier. Um, but sometimes it can get more complex and, um, we're not going to get into level B or any of the kind of hydraulic analysis that goes with that. But um, that is something that's certainly available in the future for those that get kind of practiced up. Um, one thing I want to mention in terms of logistics in the meeting, um, feel free to ask questions along the way. I'd recommend you use the raise hand feature. There's on the bottom of your bar, you should see a raise hand icon, a little hand there. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on that if I see somebody raising their hand um, um, you know, what I'm thinking is if when I'm presenting, I have a PowerPoint here, I might not be able to see the folks in your hand. So I guess maybe try it. And if I don't catch it, feel free to speak up. It is likely that a lot of questions will be answered as we go through the presentation. So um, your call, if you want to um, speak up and ask on the fly, or if you maybe want to save your questions, they might get answered uh, throughout the presentation. Um, let's see here. Let me pull up my screen and we'll get going. I'm going to turn my camera off just so I can save some of my bandwidth here. And catch my screen. Okay, there's probably going to be a little bit of a delay as I speak versus what you see in terms of the screens. Um, so you should see the kind of um, non-formal preview here. I'm going to go ahead and start the slideshow so it's full screen. And I'd like to be able to see my notes. Can somebody tell me, are you guys seeing the full screen of the overview slide or are you seeing the notes on the right side? We got the full screen. Okay, great. I am going to, what, I want to see if I can switch my screens for me. Does this change things for you all? Are you still looking at the full screen? Again, it might be a little delayed to show up. It's just a little bit more zoomed in. I think we're good. Okay. Okay, great. Um, let's get back to the correct slide. This is the this is the front slide. So again, this uh, this is a barrier assessment protocol by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. This protocol has changed over the years, and they did. Um, a relatively minor revision, although if you ask the DFW FIST Passage program staff, they spent a lot of time to revise the protocol. But the good news is, is that we're working on a pretty fresh update to the protocol as of August last year. Um, you can find this online. There's a lot of information. The next slide will show um, some of the different chapters. Um, in this class, you know, it's generally 50% in the class 50 percent in the field so obviously we're in our class setting here and we're going to cover several things and we'll go over the information collected at each site and the basic criteria that we use to call any structure a barrier or a non-barrier um, and again there's assessment protocols for these culverts and the protocols for fish passage structures other than culverts now we're not going to cover those i'm going to go to the next slide and you should see the chapter breakdown of this manual Okay, so the manual um, has 12 chapters and appendices. Um, the good news is that in terms of restoration for most of our stream networks, the uh, chapter three, 
culvert crossings is the biggest ailment or the biggest limiting factors for fish passage. But these other chapters, non-culvert crossings, dams, obstructions, natural barriers, those are all um, really important. And as the State Department of Fish and Wildlife um, manages the fisheries with our co-managers, the tribal co-managers, they need to have protocols for all of those. Um, it is very interesting stuff. You can certainly go down the rabbit hole, uh, particularly with natural barriers. That's really um, kind of interesting and fun to look at. There's a lot of science and biology as to how far an adult salmon can leap their angle of leap, how deep the water needs to be to launch up into a waterfall or something like a cascade that's a natural barrier. But for our purposes today, we're going to cover chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three. I'm wondering, oh, there we go. I can move that to the side. Sorry, I, I had uh, something in the way of my arrow, the recording notification. Okay, so what we do, this is we're on, we're on site now. We we'll have a culvert, and um, the first thing we want to do is collect the site information. You know, basically, where is the site? How does it fit into the surrounding landscape? What's its potential for fish use? Um, this also includes once we've determined that is um, determining whether the structure is a barrier or not. So there's a couple forms that we'll get familiar with. One is the site description form, which you'll see in the next slide. And the next one is this level A assessment form. So here's the site description form. The highlighted sections, um, hopefully you can see clearly, are, are very important. These are the ones that we want to try to nail down. There's one caveat to that, and that is the site ID. That's the very first one. Um, some sites we might go to will probably have a site ID. Uh, so when you're in the field and you have a culvert and maybe you don't have the site ID on hand, but you want to survey it, it's okay to leave that blank, but we do want to get the latitude and longitude, basically the location, the GPS location of that site. We do have GPSs in the kit and we'll cover that tomorrow. And then the next two um, can be um, a little bit tricky, fish use potential versus fish use criteria. And we're going to get into that, but the other information is important, but it's also things that we can get on from the desktop, not necessarily on site. I would say um, the fish use potential and the actual location, latitude, longitude is the most important. And then also on the desktop, that site ID, we can always go back with our latitude and longitude that we gathered in the field and identify via the WDFW database, which is a map online, a web map, and many of you have probably seen that. Um, we can enter our latitude and longitude and identify if there's already a site ID. So site information. Um, imagine that we're performing an inventory, meaning we're going to do a lot of different sites and we're trying to do an inventory of barriers. And we discover a crossing that isn't currently in the WDFW fish that passes database. Um, that's really what we're looking for too. Um, either updated data and in terms of, um, our relationship with WDFW, they are hoping that TU and our volunteers can get data for sites that haven't been surveyed in maybe 10 years or more. And if you find a site that hasn't been surveyed in eight or nine years, I would still recommend going ahead and surveying it. But there might be sites that have not been surveyed at all. Um, there's certainly a lot of sites on private property like that and, um, and elsewhere. Um, when we locate a fish passes feature, basically, any type of road stream crossing, which could be a culvert or a bridge, we want to collect the following information. We want to assign a unique site identifier. Again, this is the site ID where if we don't have one, we need to identify one. And we have a list of unused site IDs. Nick has that. That was provided by DFW. So if you are in the field, you don't think or aren't aware that this has been um, surveyed before, uh, you come back home and we confirm with, with Nick or the BAT team that, yeah, this doesn't look like it's been surveyed. We can pull one of the unused site IDs that DFW provided us to put in that space. And uh, that's really good information. If there's no information at a particular road stream crossing, um, obviously that's going to be valuable for all of us, including DFW. Now we're going to get into the fish use criteria and the fish use potential. So, Fish use potential is essentially yes, no, or unknown. 
but sometimes uh, we're not going to be able to see the fish. Um, when in doubt, you can say unknown. But there are ways we can identify fish use potential in terms of um, this fish use criteria. So as you see here, biological, you actually see fish in the stream. Um, salmonids generally swim. So salmonids could also include resident trout. They usually swim kind of in the water column, and but they don't dart around along the bottom. You know, sometimes when you're wading through a stream, you'll see the sculpin or codded family of species, and they dart, you know, and take cover under the rocks. Generally speaking, salmonids, whether juvenile salmon or resident trout or adult salmon for that matter, they swim differently. And uh, once you get to know them a little bit, and uh, many of you are probably anglers, so you're probably already ahead on this, um, you can identify, is that a salmonid? And that's, that's a good thing to note. But biological, you see fish um, mapped. There are, there are databases we can go on, um, again, on the desktop to see after you've been to a site or even before you go to a site, is there fish use here and is it mapped? Um, DNR water type maps are really helpful. Those maps have been field verified for fish and that includes fish like sculpin. But if it is a fish stream, it gets different forest practice rules, meaning um, the timber industry has to leave certain buffers on resident fish streams versus resident and anadromous fish streams. But mapped is really helpful. I use that all the time. And we can dive into that, um, even talk about it a little bit more tomorrow if folks are interested in these different mapped resources. Um, I can show you some of those. And maybe at the end of today, we'll see how much time we have. Um, the next is physical. And again, this is a hierarchy. So seeing fish is most important. If there's documented fish use via a, a database map or something, that would be the next in line. And then the physical, there's a, just two physical parameters that you could say, yes, this meets physical criteria for fish use potential. We'll talk about that again, next slide. And then there's other, you know, there could be um, a recent study that's documenting things, or there could be local knowledge, um, or you yourself may know that there's fish in this stream, but it's not biologically documented, mapped, or, um, and it likely will fit physical. Um, moving on here, we're going to get into the physical criteria. So scour line width is something we'll look at. There'll be some images on the next slide, but essentially it is the width of the stream that's been scoured. So the stream bed that has raw material, whether it's gravel or cobble, um, it could be silt, you know, finer sediment, but it's where the, the stream has scoured the bed to a point where there's not really going to be plants growing like you'll see up on the banks. Scour line width should not be confused with bank full width. Generally speaking, scour line width will be a little bit narrower, narrower and down in the stream bed where a bank full width is the width of the stream right before it would jump its banks and come over the banks connecting to the floodplain, if you will. And we're going to talk about these in the field tomorrow. So that's one in Western Washington, as you can see, it's 0.6 meters minimum scour line width. And on the east side, it's a little bit bigger. And then the other one is gradient. If you find a stream that's more than 20% gradient, then over 160 meters, then it is considered a natural barrier to Pacific salmon. Um, for um, There is places where you can have 20% gradient for a short period, and it's not considered a natural barrier. But again, these are the two physical criteria. Um, oftentimes with our own eyes, looking at a 20% gradient in a stream, you wouldn't think that it would have fish in it. So um, our laser distance measure can take inclination or gradient, and we'll go through that tomorrow. But in general, um, most sites that you'll be going to won't be that steep. And we can talk about that in the field. So here we're talking about scour line width. Scour line width um, is the horizontal distance between scour marks on both banks. The scours are created by regularly reoccurring winter flows, which have a distinct scoured mark on either bank of the channel. This is roughly representative of the width of the potential salmonid habitat during winter season. Um, you're going to get questions about forest practice rules, like I mentioned here about um, bank full versus scour line width. Um, and it, we just want to make sure that when we're talking about scour line width versus bank full, we're clear with our data. And our data sheet really clearly calls for one versus the other. 
So this is a great image that kind of gives a sense of scour line width versus bank full. Sometimes you'll see the moss or you'll see a debris line, like a rack line on the bank where high water has receded and left things um, to give you indications. Um, bank full and scour line width are not always easy to identify, especially bank full width. Uh, we'll talk a lot about that tomorrow again, but it's really good idea when you're taking bank full width you try to take several measurements outside of the influence of the culvert. Um, moving on here, um, measuring scour line width, you want to measure perpendicular to the flow outside of the normal stream function that's influenced by the free, the feature, again, the culvert. Um, scour line width, just like bank full, you can take several measurements. In this photo here, you can see that it might not be the best place to take this measurement. It's kind of on a bend. It's the beginning of a bend, whereas just upstream, it's a little bit more of a straight stretch. The most important thing is to measure where it's a good representation of the stream. The scour line width and the bank full width are real indicators as to how much water this stream will convey throughout the year and throughout different seasons. And that directs that di relates directly to the culvert and is the culvert undersized versus the stream and the water that it carries. So as I mentioned, you want to measure that outside of the culvert influence. So this image below, as you can see, there's the, the rectangle, the gray rectangle is a culvert. So imagine there's a road over the top of that. And you can see the upstream versus downstream. This, this is kind of a classic scene of an undersized culvert. So the culvert is diameter is too small for the stream and the water that it is that is flowing through it. And you'll get a sediment wedge on the upstream end of the pipe. So as higher flows come in, it cannot the culvert cannot convey that water fast enough. So you might get some ponding or a pool forming on the upstream end of the culvert. That ponding or pool is less velocity and the sediment will settle out. And you can actually start filling the channel and sediment will back up stream, upstream of the pipe and make kind of what I would call a sediment wedge. And on the downstream, you see a scour pool. As the undersized culvert conveys the water, it kind of comes out of the other end like a fire hose and it scours more or less a natural scour pool outside the culvert. It's just something to look for in terms of features and understanding how the stream works with that culvert or, or road stream crossing structure. Um, non fish bearing streams, um, this can come in sometimes when you have a culvert, because there's a lot of culverts that go into roads. Um, in fact, there's a, probably a lot more of those type of culverts that I would call cross stitches or just drainage culverts that are conveying water that don't have fish in them. But it's a good idea if you are out there and you're going to multiple sites and you see one that has fish use potential unknown. Um, you could take some measurements and take um, some notes down, but generally, if it doesn't have um, meet that physical criteria at a minimum, I would recommend moving on. So again, the physical criteria in Western Washington is a scour line width less than 0.6 meters or about two feet or um, that 20% gradient. Generally speaking, um, if you believe that a, a stream is non-fish bearing, you can move right along. So there's multiple ways that these culverts can become a barrier. And there's some good il illustrations here. Excessive water drop, like the top left, we call that water surface drop. Obviously, fish can't only leap so high. So that's one way these culverts can be deemed a barrier. Um, there's also velocity, um, where medium to higher flows, fish cannot actually get through a culvert. They get exhausted and tired. Um, and to be fair, sometimes we'll have um, a barrier culvert that fish are able to pass through sometimes, but not the majority of the time. And just sometimes you'll see that you might have a barrier culvert, but you'll see adult salmon upstream spawning. It doesn't mean that it's incorrect to call it a barrier. Um, it might be um, a lower percent passable barrier, and we'll get into the percent passability. Also, water depth. There's um, on Highway 3 there in Chico Creek on the Kitsap, there is a shallow 
barrier that is really problematic for the chum salmon that go up Chico Creek. And luckily there's um, some long-term plans to fix that issue, but um, multiple elements here. So let's switch gears a little bit. Um, well, I guess we're not switching gears yet. We're gonna switch on the next slide. Sorry, folks. Um, so the DFW basis for barrier criteria is not very clear. Um, it's based on Salmon's swimming abilities and it's also based on particularly velocity and water surface drop for six inch trout. So that water surface drop, like you see in that top picture there, um, we want to make sure that trout, but also juvenile salmon can get upstream and jump that high. Um, for example, coho fry or, or coho, um, once they have grown out of the fry stage and they're rearing in the stream, they will swim upstream and sometimes they'll migrate quite a ways upstream just as small fish during the summer to get out of um, uh, warmer stream temperatures. Sometimes they need to move upstream in the fall to find refuge out of high flows for, from winter flows. They need to find that off channel habitat or that kind of softer water and they have to get through a culvert to do so. But then we also have depth, that depth criteria is specific for adult Chinook salmon. Um, you don't have to remember all of this stuff. It's just giving you a little bit of background on the very complex analysis that DFW did and analyzing what is a depth barrier versus a velocity barrier versus a water surface barrier. Again, just background, pretty, pretty dense here. And it gets even more dense on the next one. Um, so fist passes criteria only applies to a range of flows that we, we can call fish passage flows. These are the flows where we anticipate that salmonids will be attempting to move upstream. Fish passage flows are between 95% exceedance flow, and that is 95% of the flows are greater than this. And only 5% are lower. And the 10% exceedance flow, only 10% of the flows are greater. So the point is, if we have 100% passable culvert, there may be circumstances where it might not be passable. So on the low flow, it's about 5% of the time, and on the high flow, it's about 10% of the time. It's just giving you, again, more background on the protocol and where this fits, because if you hear about a 100% non-passable barriers, which would actually be 0% passable barrier, there may be times when fish can get through that. And this is giving you a little bit of background. There's depth, velocity, base here. Um, I, again, you guys all don't need to memorize this whatsoever. It's just giving you some background. We are going to get into the actual level A and the fun stuff here in just a minute. So this is giving you some of the more of the protocol on these flows. I'm going to move a little bit faster through this, but it gives you a sense of the velocity and there's a fire hydrant picture. And um, there are times when fish can pass through these as adults, but not juveniles. And also different species have different swimming abilities in terms of fighting against the velocity. Um, next, we're going to talk about um, the water depth in the culvert. This is this scene makes me cringe, <laughs> but um, obviously we can't have our fish getting too worn out rubbing against culverts or concrete as they try to make their way upstream. So that low fish passage flow is really trying to get them to the spawning grounds as adults. Um, again, the Chinook salmon is the depth criteria for that. Um, mo moving on jumping ability, water surface depth, the vertical distance that fish have to leap from um, surface water to surface water. So that's the surface water of the pool downstream of the culvert and then the surface water inside the culvert. And we'll talk about how to measure that because you want to measure from water surface to water surface to get that depth. And we're just about to get to the, the interesting stuff here. What is passability? You know, a 0% passable culvert is basically beamed a total barrier. But again, some periods may be able to pass, or some adult fish may be able to pass at certain flows, 33%, um, 67%, and then 100%. These are the standard labels given to barrier culverts. You won't really hear about any culverts that are 50% passable. It's generally going to be one of these for anyone that's using this protocol. Um, as you can imagine, a 67% passable barrier might not be as prioritized as highly as a 33% passable barrier. 
or a 0% passable barrier. A 0% passable barrier obviously is going to block a lot of adult fish and really bring back um, productivity. So this is a step-by-step -step of what we do when we get to site. We encounter the culvert. We're going to record the location information. And then we're going to get to our level A barrier assessment. I'm going to go fast through these next few and I'll get all these pulled up and I'll, I'll pause so you can kind of read through this. So this is the process step by step. And later you're going to see a decision tree. And this decision tree looks very similar to this. It's not quite the same, but it's how do you take the next steps from the initial data you get from a level A. And we have this decision tree laminated in all of our barrier assessment kits. This is your best friend. <laughs> it's also on the back side, it has reference tables as to how to identify, okay, I measured a water surface depth of this amount. What does that mean? How do I get to 33% passable or 67% passable or whatever it is? We have these reference tables in our kit and you'll get to know those more tomorrow. So here's the level A form. Don't be too intimidated. <laughs> because there's really good references on the backside. Each of our forms has a reference. You can hopefully see the little numbers by each metric. I would say anywhere there's a box or a blank spot is a metric. And we can go through these one at a time. So let's we'll say we've done our site description form. At a minimum, we have our um, latitude and longitude, our location. We have our site ID if we know it. And then we have the fish use potential. If the fish use potential, if we're not sure, you're not comfortable, again, when in doubt, say unknown. Next, we get to level A and we actually pull out our equipment and start measuring. So first things first, culvert number. Um, I'm gonna go through each of the metrics now and um, we'll go back to the level A form. It's not sequenced in, this, in these slides, but I do wanna go back and that's probably where we'll end today is we'll go back to the level A form and we'll walk through it one by one. So sometimes you come to a crossing, there's more than one culvert, as you can see here. In general, you name culverts from the stream's perspective. So when you think of a river or a stream, it's flowing downhill, down river. And I think of that as its viewpoint. So imagine a stream flowing this direction down the hill it behind it upstream is the back downstream is where its eyes are facing forward so if you hear somebody say river left bank that's generally speaking from the stream's perspective not from the angler's perspective or the person's perspective so if you're looking upstream and i'm trying to explain something on river left bank it's not from your perspective it's not the bank toward your left looking upstream it's actually the bank on your right bank now it goes the same for naming these culverts. A single culvert is 1.1, one culvert out of one. But if you find multiple culverts, you can see here it's 1.2 and 2.2. Now these photos are confusing. The middle photo on the bottom and the photo on the right, we're looking upstream at these culverts. So literally they're um, a little misleading. These culverts should be named. So let's look at the, the one on the far right with three pipes. If you're looking at the pipe on the far left from this view, that is culvert 3.3. Whereas the culvert on the far right is 1.3 from the stream's perspective. I hope that makes sense. But these photos have, are always catching us a little bit. So what if there's multiple pipes at a crossing, but they're not at the same elevation? Sometimes um, road departments will put in an overflow pipe so let's say they've installed a culvert and the stream's coming through, they get some high flows and it's becoming a problem for the stream. They'll, they will sometimes add a pipe to then um, relieve some of the flow through their main culverts. Really um, draw an imaginary line through the midway point of the lowest culvert. If any of the other culverts in, the, in, that, in that horizontal line touch, then they're considered part of the sequence. So you should name them. So for example, in this image, you're gonna have two culverts, 1.2 and 2.2. 2. 
But that smaller culvert on the right, we're going to call that an overflow culvert. And we should note that and we should take pictures of that on all these sites. We'll take pictures and we'll get to that. But um, there's some examples of this. And it's important to say that we're identifying this where the water enters the culvert. So again, we are upstream of the culverts looking downstream where the water enters the culvert. That's where you want to make this line. Try not to do this on the downstream end because multiple culverts at one crossing can have different slopes and they can look differently in terms of how they line up at the outlet of the culvert versus the inlet. And the inlet is the upstream end. So here we go. Um, culvert number one, two, and two of two. So at this perspective, we are upstream looking downstream at the inlet of these culverts. And you see, I, I'm hoping that my, my delay isn't too long, but you have the 0.61, you know, you're, you're about 0.61 meter, that's the diameter, round CST is corrugated steel overflow pipe on right bank. Um, it also notes that all these pipes must be within the bank full width. So if you're at a stream crossing and you see a pipe, but it is way off to the side out of the bank full width of the stream, and it could still be an overflow pipe, but it's not something that we need to be concerned with. That's pretty rare. Usually if you see an overflow pipe and even them are not rare, but they're um, not as common, um, they're generally gonna be near the other culverts because that's where the water's coming from. So we're gonna get through some images here. So here we're looking at downstream. You think that that right pipe would be one to measure, but then we go upstream. Hypothetically, this is the exact same location and we should be looking at it from this side, from the inlet or the upstream side. So look at that pipe on the left. It's an overflow pipe. We don't need to measure that. We should not account for that. We can measure it and make note of it, but we shouldn't account for it in our level A passability. I'm going to pause real quick and just see if anybody has any questions because there's a lot of information here and we're moving along. Okay, silence is good. Can somebody um, let me know? Is, is It sounds like there's no issues with audio or the delay. It, my images and what I'm saying making sense to everyone? Yep, everything's matching yes, up, Luke. Yes, it's fine. Great, thank you guys. Okay. I think we already talked about this. <laughs> Don't include the overflow pipe if it's looking like this on the upstream end. And this image is always fun. <laughs> you will see um, some really interesting solutions, almost hindsight solutions to some stream crossings. I have seen um, a similar thing to this so they put that that concrete box culvert i'd call that in on the bottom not a classic round culvert but a concrete box and it's undersized so they added a big pipe on top of it sometimes they'll see you'll see an old pipe an old culvert and there will be a bigger culvert on right on top of it they just leave the pipe in they dig down just enough and lay a new pipe in on top not ideal in terms of the fish and habitat but it's something you might see. Again, anything unusual like this, um, there may not be a standard protocol on which box to check or how to uh, record that, but just take notes and take pictures. Pictures are really, really valuable. So this, we're gonna talk about different kinds of culverts and on the level A sheet, you know, it's not gonna say precast concrete as the option, it'll say PCC. But luckily at that metric, there'll be that little number you can flip that level A form around on the back side, and that number will um, reference PCC is precast concrete. CPC is cast in place concrete. Um, cast in place is pretty rare. That image of uh, what looks like a bridge um, is a cast in place. But generally these days, um, a spanning bridge would be a bridge over 20 feet for by federal highway standards, or um, it'll be a precast concrete which you'll see in a couple um, slides. Those are considered box culverts and box culverts, um, concrete box culverts can be a full box that they um, countersink in the stream bed or they can be bottomless where it's just kind of like a concrete arch with footings. 
but you will get to know these tomorrow and hopefully we have some different materials really common is corrugated steel corrugated aluminum and then we'll see old um, these precast concrete um, pipes and they'll come in sections if you can see in that image there'll be times where these co precast concrete pipes over time become disconnected they might sag um, and the water can seep through it um, we have flashlights in our kits in our in our field vests and it's a really good idea it's one thing to take these measurements and the slope and everything with level a but um, you do want to peer into the culvert at the bottom at uh, the outlet end and the upstream end where possible and safe um, just to see if there's any issues in there and there's a water surface depth or, or water surface drop we'll talk about in a minute and sometimes there can be problems inside the pipe that you wouldn't know if you didn't really look in there so here we go precast concrete cast in place concrete next slide you should see steel and cst is corrugated steel we also have magnets in our kits just a simple little magnet from the hardware store and it's really important that we use that look at these two pipes we have the aluminum on the bottom steel on the top you know steel will rust aluminum won't but i have seen time and time again where it appears that there's rust and there may be some some iron precipitate on the pipe but not rusting the pipe so all you have to do is take your magnet and see if it's magnetic as most of you probably know aluminum is not magnetic i love playing this game you get to a new pipe and you try to guess what it is and i've been wrong more than once but my magnet never lies um so sst is smooth steel um, we're actually working on a big project in the Chehalis right now. Um, it's a really great project. It's the top 1% of all the barriers of the 1100 barriers in the Chehalis. Um, and it's a repurposed steel tank and they cut the ends off of the tank and they use it as a culvert years ago. Smooth steel isn't very common, but look out for those. Um, they're definitely different than the corrugated steel and the hydrology is different. The corrugation on, on those pipes actually helps the friction of the water. It's a little bit better for the fish, but a smooth steel pipe as you can imagine, the water just slides right through it. And that goes the same for the plastic. Most plastic pipes are corrugated on the outside, but not on the inside. And the reason for that is they want to convey the water fast. That's good for, for road departments, but not good for fish as much. And you'll see plastics used a lot more on non-fish bearing streams on those, those cross drain culverts. So not to take that too far, but um, if you see a small plastic pipe and you're not sure if it's a fish stream or not, um, that could be a little bit of an indicator if it's a relatively new plastic pipe that it might not be a fish stream. Um, they might have been able to permit that and um, put in something that would be a barrier if fish were present. Just just a little bit of a, um, a hint there or a clue, if you will. And then we have steel. SPS is structural plate steel. You'll generally see these as larger pipes on a little bit bigger streams. Structural plate meaning that they assembled it on site. So this is not a corrugated pipe that's smooth all the way around. You will actually see on the structural plate, there's plates of them that they had to bolt or rivet together. It's kind of hard to see in the top image, but on the bottom image, you can see those bolts where they actually put the plates together and you can have aluminum or steel. Um, timber. Uh, stringer bridges or timber type culverts are not uncommon. Um, we have a lot of them up on the Olympic Peninsula, which is probably no surprise. But there is a timber option if you've come into a stream row crossing that has kind of timbers. A lot of times um, there'll be really old logs and they, they will put um, a concrete slab on top of them and call it good. A lot of those are very old. And um, we actually are designing another one up there on the OP that has timber stringers and we estimate it's 60 years old it's a pretty cool site but we did our standard level a it seemed unusual at the time because we weren't measuring around pipe we just did the exact same thing but with um, that timber crossing and it was a barrier the the crossing is way too narrow for the stream and then masonry i personally haven't surveyed any masonry but if you ever see a road stream crossing like that you just apply the same methodology so before we get in um, to measuring, there's a couple things in terms of terminology. Um, this is a culvert. I'm, I'm using my cursor here. You can see the round culvert. The invert is the bottom, the inside bottom of the culvert. That is definitely something um, we should try to remember. And you could just say, hey, the bottom of the culvert. But if you hear me talking, I'll, I'll use words like invert, 
soffit is the inside top, just like, you know, those of you that know your roof, you know, overhangs and the soffit's the inside underneath and the crown is the top. For most of our purposes, we're going to be measuring off the invert upstream and downstream end of the culvert. On the bottom, you see a skewed measurement and you see the flow. Sometimes pipes will be cut with a beveled end. So this pipe is a beveled pipe. They'll do that to catch the water. If the water isn't, the stream isn't perfectly aligned with the pipe, it's coming in at an angle, they might bevel it like that. Sometimes it'll be beveled with a lip on the bottom just to get the water further away from the road prism as much as possible. But you see the red versus the green, the span is essentially the diameter of the pipe. So you gotta make sure when you're measuring, especially if you have kind of a, an angled or beveled end that you're not measuring across there. You wanna come perpendicular to the walls of the culvert to get that span. And then rise. So the span, this is actually called a squash pipe. And we do see some of these out there. Um, this top right image shows a good measurement of the span. That is getting the widest part of that pipe. Any shape of the pipe, when you do the span, you take the widest part and same for the rise. So just like diameter, if you have a different shape pipe, you're gonna get the span of the rise. Now a round pipe, right? will have the exact same number generally, but you wanna measure it for real because sometimes pipe, a, pipes age or get corroded or they were installed and they got bent. Go ahead and don't assume if you have a round pipe, when you take the span across, that it's always gonna be the exact same on the rise. Go ahead and measure and write down what you have. Um, you want to do this out the outlet of the pipe. I sometimes will also measure the span and the rise at the inlet. And sometimes you'll get surprised. Some of these older culverts will have retrofitting. Um, many times we've seen where there's a, a precast concrete pipe at the outlet. You're setting up your level A, you're taking some measurements, and then you go to the inlet of the pipe and it's corrugated steel or it's plastic or it's a different material altogether. And um, because it's expensive, this infrastructure is not cheap to just fix. They'll retrofit a lot of times. So again, the flashlight, um, measuring both ends of the pipe, just really trying to get to know the pipe is really helpful. That image on the lower right is a gravel probe, or it's really a tile probe that they use, you know, in agricultural lands to identify tiles for drainage and such. Um, but we use that as a stream probe. And sometimes we need to probe down through the sediment to find that invert, to find the inside bottom of the pipe. If a pipe is countersunk, that means it has um, stream sediment in it. And there's a little bit more definition to that we'll get into. But um, you want it to get the rise, as you can imagine, and there's, there's sediment along the bottom of the pipe, you're gonna need to try to whittle your way down until you tink, 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 you hit the bottom of the pipe. Then you can measure up from the gravel probe add the two together, the length of the gravel probe, plus your measurement to the soffit or the top, and you have your rise. Countersunk pipes are nice. They're great for fish. I love to see them. Um, but there are times, even if you have a four foot gravel probe, you can't reach the bottom of the pipe. Um, that could be because it's a bottomless pipe. There we have arch pipes, um, but um, some pipes are so big, there's uh, enough stream channel in it, four feet of probe won't get there. In that point, you can be a little bit creative um, make note of that if you can't get a rise the traditional way, how you estimated it. And um, again, this is trying to be a protocol, right? Trying to be consistent, but every single pipe is different. So sometimes you got to think on your toes a little bit. Again, the best thing to do is measure what you can, take notes, take pictures. Um, when you measure water depth in the pipe, Water depth in the pipe will very often change, as you can imagine, throughout the pipe. So at the inlet of the pipe, it could be much deeper or shallower than the outlet. The protocol calls for an approximate measurement six inches in. And we are in metric here. So you try to measure, our, our tape measures are in metric. It's a little bit of a change versus, um, you know, doing the standard inches and such. But we'll get some practice tomorrow. And um, water depth is important for multiple reasons. But again, that should, adult should not... Uh, being able to pass through is important at certain flows. So here's some different shapes. We talked about the material. We did talk about a few of the metrics, but we do see these. Um, and we talked, we already saw a lot, right? Round, squash. Now the R and D for round is what you'll see on the level A sheet and same for squash and ellipse is ELL. 
Luckily, all of these um, are on the back side of our level A form. So imagine though that you're in a stream and you're trying to get the the rise, and you have your gravel probe. Um, you could be probing forever. Consider that it could be an arch. And if you're not sure and you can't find the bottom of a pipe, try to explore uh, for footings. This image on both of these the arches shows you know these little boxes. Um, they'll always put footings in these, and they should be below the stream bed. So they it, ideally they won't be visible. But you can use your probe to poke around the edge and see if you can find a footing. That can be a good hint too, whether or not it's an arch or a, it's like a countersunk round or bottom. So now we're getting to the water surface drop. This is um, probably one of my favorites, just because you see the water acting this way, and it's a very it can be a very clear barrier um, versus having to go into hydraulic modeling and, and seeing because that's for for hydraulic modeling stuff like a level B. That's where you can really identify it's a velocity barrier and a depth barrier. Um, but the water surface drop, you can do a level A, and if you have a certain amount of water surface drop, you're done. You identify the barrier. Um, it's important here to know, I mean, you can read uh, right here on the slide, but there could be um, a slope break in the pipe. And this is an example of a pipe that's been retrofitted, you know, with another piece. Um, there can be a water service drop in the pipe and also at the inlet. So consider measuring anywhere in the pipe, there is a water surface drop. And I'm going to use my arrow. You're going to measure the water surface here to the pool water surface here. And sometimes, you know, depending on the velocity, it can come way out and curve down and it's hard to, to actually get the measurement vertically. So you have to get creative, um, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, at the inlet, it's pretty common that you'll get a pipe that's a little bit plugged or maybe there's a log that's racked up in front of it. You're going to have to use your judgment there, whether or not that is a more permanent feature, like it's not going to wash out on the next storm. And that water surface drop will be there if you go back in six months. Go ahead and call it. Um, there is chances, though, that sometimes even just you get some branches or some leaf debris, and it can really kind of build up a little bit. But if you kick it around with your foot and just washes through the pipe, obviously it's not a water surface drop. So at the inlet of the pipe, you can get little drops and sometimes big drops, but just consider how how much it's going to impede salmon in the long run. Um, the next image is going to show a picture here. You want to measure, and so here's two pipes. I know it's harder to see the pipe to the right, but you want to measure the water surface drops on, on any of the pipes at any location. And you want to record the max drop, water surface drop, that is, on that metric on level A. So it's, it's line 10 and 11. And then other drops that are lesser, you know, not the max, but the lesser drops, you do want to record in the notes. So measure them all, jot down the biggest drop, but make sure um, the other drops are recorded. So um, this image, again, is a little outdated, but it's a really good image to show this water's coming out of the pipe, water surface drop, and then it's cascading over riprap boulders here. And the point is you want to think like a fish. The fish has to be in the pool and jump up into the pipe. You know, they can't kind of crawl up here and jump halfway up where the water is touching and, and impacting the, the riprap. You really just want to think like a fish. There goes the fish. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed that imagery. Hopefully they came through. Um, and then we'll, hopefully we'll see some water surface drop tomorrow. Um, but if not, we can sure talk about it. And hypothetically, you can definitely visualize it when you're on site. Um, another feature are aprons. And not to be confused with those beveled ends. So a beveled end is a pipe of the same diameter that's just cut at an angle. Aprons act to actually diffuse the flow, and they can be at the in stream or the upstream or downstream end. Um, where, where I work on the coast, um, I hardly ever see aprons, but they are pretty common. I think they're more common in more developed areas. So um, if you do see an apron, you come along one, treat it as part of the pipe. So when you're shooting, when I say shooting, you're going, you're um, taking elevations of the invert of the upstream end of the pipe and the downstream end of the pipe. That's going to give us the slope of the pipe. Make sure you're taking that that point to the end of the apron. That's essentially part of um, the culvert. 
So here you go, a better image. And I'm getting ahead of my slides here. But um, so this is an example like where we have an apron length without aprons, right? You're going to measure just the pipe. But if you have aprons, you want to take the full length. Um, now slope. So we have our laser level kits and it seems a little intimidating if you haven't used these before, but um, you'll get really familiar with them tomorrow. And once you do get familiar, they're really efficient. And what we're going to do is measure the invert of the culvert upstream and downstream. So this arrow is showing, you know, obviously we're going to measure inside the pipe, just inside that lip on both ends. And then it's the old math problem, rise over run to get your percent slope. Um, essentially, you're going to have an elevation upstream, let's say it's 10 feet, and an elevation downstream, let's say it's 8 feet. So there's two feet of difference in between those two. And then so that's your rise, the elevation rise. And then run is the length. Let's say it's 20 feet. So you got two feet over 20 feet. That's 44%. I don't know if I'm doing that right, but we'll practice tomorrow. Um, there is some helpful hints on our, on our um, sheets. And then Nick and the team have done a great job with the step-by-step -step and the FAQs uh, on the bat site. I hope that you have all seen that. But after tomorrow and we get um, a little bit of practice and we get our hands dirty, I really recommend you go back into the bat site and look at that FAQ document because it definitely helps clarify some things that have come up in the past. So road fill depth is another one. Um, not to be confused with the top of the pipe, um, some engineers consider the road fill depth from the um, the soffit or the crown of the pipe to the surface of the road. But as you can imagine, you can this picture is great because it really shows all the road prism and all that material goes all the way to the bottom of the pipe. So when we do road fill depth, you want to measure from the invert all the way up just to the nearest meter. This is definitely not as important to get a, a, a specific number or a specific elevation as it is when we're actually measuring the inverse of the pipe for slope and length and such. So you'll see road fill depth on the sheet. And then countersunk, um, you know, some pipes will be over the countersunk. You see the gravel probe going pretty deep in this image. And there are times when you can't even find the bottom, which might be there and it probably is there in this pipe. It does not look like an arch, but, um, do the best you can, but the countersunk part is really important. And that decision tree I mentioned, what do we do next? We have our level A information. Do I need to go to a level B? Is this a barrier? That decision tree will ask you as well as a countersunk, and that's going to take you two different routes. So countersunk by definition is 20% of fill or sediment inside the pipe at the outlet and sediment throughout the pipe. So the inlet at the pipe doesn't have to have 20% sediment, but it should have some. And the next slide really shows it clearly. This is, this is one to really try to take um, a little photo memory of this. And that bottom one, I mean, the, the, the second one is pretty clear because you wouldn't have any sediment at the inlet. This is the flow. You know, it's like, well, not countersunk. I can see the bottom pipe right here. But you, have, you can have times like this bottom one where it says no. Where you see sediment here, you see sediment there. Again, it's a good idea to have a flashlight where possible. If you can see that there's exposed um, invert on the inside of the pipe, it is not countersunk. So countersunk is something worth talking about if you're surveying. I mean, I think we all survey with a partner. Um, if you're going to call it countersunk, be, be pretty confident with that. And the 20%, that 20% at the outlet of the culvert, take your time and don't feel rushed. You know, you're going to measure that span. You're going to measure the rise. You're going to have a gravel probe, and you're going to use the gravel probe to identify how deep is the sediment. Is it 20%? And um, a little bit of math can help you with that pretty quick. So, again, hopefully we have some water surface drop tomorrow. Hopefully we have a counter sump pipe. But if we don't, we can talk through it and just imagine some hypotheticals. That's really helpful. Um, backwater is another one. This is one that has changed for me this year. They changed their definition. So I'm going to read verbatim what they have in their notes here. It says, uh, backwater is a field indicator of whether slope is in a good surrogate for velocity or depth. Often there are culverts that have a high slope but are in a very low energy system, such as a slough or a wetland. If that's the case, slope will be a poor surrogate for velocity or depth. 
The point is, when we're looking at backwater, all we need to remember is, is the average velocity through the entire length of the culvert visibly slower than the average velocity in the adjacent channel? Or is there little or no visible flow through the entire length of the culvert? Most all the time, you will not find backwater culverts. But this image just showing a still, still, well, it's more of a bridge here, but um, an arch, that's, that would be backwater. What I look for is any visible flow. Um, it used to be any visible flow at the inlet or the outlet, it could not be backwater. But now they're telling us average velocity, again, that first bullet is significantly lower than the adjacent stream or the natural stream channel. Um, it could be considered backwater. I would, I would be cautious about that. If you're unsure about backwater, uh, maybe explain what you're seeing. And, and, you know, the photos may not take that um, that might be one place where the photos don't help as much in terms of getting the, the movement of water. But um, backwater is another big one on that decision tree, which will take you one way or the other. And again, this is all defined on the back of the level A form. So here's an example of the outlet. Uh, there's a lot of aquatic vegetation there. Doesn't, I don't see any ripples. It looks like it's not moving very much, but then you go to the inlet and you're in, you're saying, oh, look at that. Observe, point is, observe both ends of the culvert. I have seen this a lot where it appears to be backwatered at the outlet or the inlet. Generally, it's this, the, this scene where it looks backwatered at the outlet, but the inlet has clear flow. So make sure you check both ends. And then there's also gates. You know, there's, there's head gates for irrigation. There's tide gates like these images here. Um, there's some slides in this presentation that are going to go to those future chapters that we're not going to cover today. Um, but if you see a gate or a tide gate, anything like that, take pictures, take notes. But in general, um, for our purposes, we're not measuring or, or doing level A's on gates. Um, we also see racks pretty common and we'll see them right on our culverts as well. Sometimes they use those to collect um, debris and wood and such upstream of a culvert so that it minimizes maintenance issues and doesn't blow a culvert out, so to speak. Um, and the most important thing to know about a rack is if it's potentially going to block fish. So you should, I just advanced the slide, you should see um, kind of a sketch here of a grate or a rack over the pipe. And the, the issue here can be is if there's not a space large enough to pass an adult fish, particularly Chinook. So, I mean, you can see here on the bottom, if Chinook are present in the stream, if we know that, it needs to be at least 0.3 meters for an adult Chinook to fit through. If it's a stream that doesn't have Chinook present, you know, it's not documented um, Chinook stream, it can be a little bit smaller. The point is, is if there is one opening in the rack that meets the criteria, it's passable. So on this grid, you could have a whole bunch that are less than 0.24 meters, let's say, but you have one that actually is inside the pipe cross section and it's 0.31 meters, it's passable. R uh, racks are, are, aren't uncommon, but not, the, they're the, um, the minority, I'll say. They don't see those quite as much. Fishways are something to understand um, if you see fishways associated with a pipe um, upstream or downstream, you do want to take pictures and note that um, fishways generally shouldn't be confused with gray control, like this top right image with these um, horizontal, um, um, I would say, gradient checks or these logs going across. That is not, I would say it's not for fish passage because there is nothing in this stream that makes me think that this is like a fish ladder, if you will. This is actually trying to keep the stream from cutting down and undermining the pipe just upstream. So you could call it a fishway. Photos will tell everything. But we also have baffles. This lower left, you'll sometimes you'll see these in old pipes. And this is to assist fish. If you have a pipe that has a velocity issue, um, you'll see retrofitting where you can actually, they'll go in there and they'll install these, or sometimes they're pre-installed because they know the, the culvert's going to have to go in a pretty steep slope um, area. So the idea is that these fish, almost like a fish ladder, can get through the pipe. 
any features like this, um, just note them and take pictures. You don't have to be fishway experts, but um, there is a whole fishway chapter in the manual if anybody's interested. Okay, um, I'm a little surprised to see what's the point of this slide. Okay, yeah, this is this we've already seen this image. And, and basically, it's trying to give us some indicators. This is the metric on, on the level A form. And we already talked about skyline width versus bank full width. And this is really important to talk about tomorrow when we're in the field. So advancing on, here's an image with the same. This is a pretty good image because it shows the scour here where you got some raw stream bed material and the bank full width is not as clear on the right bank, but on the left bank, it kind of flattens out here. So you can imagine if this stream filled with water, it's going to start spilling over right at this level. And both of these are horizontal measurements. You try not to get in the habit of, okay, the top of the bank is here, but this other bank is up here you know, and you're measuring not horizontal. You want to measure horizontal essentially as the water would do. And this also notes on the slide to take multiple measurements and record the average. So you want to move around a little bit to get the representation of the stream. Very, very important measurement. We already talked about this measure horizontally. Try not to try not to measure on something that's not representative or a real bend in the pool or try not to measure where there is a deep pool because that unless it's like deep pool after deep pool and really representative of the stream. You can see how important the bank full width is here. Um, this is the DFW this is their official slide deck when they train folks and they really want to drill home how important scour line width and bank full is. Um, you can see the top of the bank where it's going to overspill again, easy way to remember bank full. Stains and vegetation can be big indicators. And this shows not such a good place to measure bank full. And the reason for that is we have a, a really high bank here and there's a little terrace here, but then it comes up real high. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Um, certain streams that are in kind of a, a, a steeper ravine, if you will, don't have a flat floodplain associated with them. The real reason that this is not a good place is you have a bit of a plunge pool. It's kind of hard to tell, but there's a lot of elevation change between this water surface where that kind of rapid riffle is, and then it pours into the pool and they're taking this measurement right at the pool. So um, you want to have to be careful about where you measure. If you went just on the other side of this log, it might be a better place closer to the tail out. And plus you're going to take a couple more measurements, maybe downstream, here and then not on the bend, but just past the bend here, you know, take a couple measurements to get that bank full. As practitioners and with my colleagues, I cannot explain how many times and how many conversations have taken place on the stream bank debating about bank full. Um, it is not an exact science, but it is a good one to get familiar with and get somewhat comfortable measuring. Okay, now we have a water surface drop here. Again, we're going to measure water surface to water surface. And um, we're going to take max depth. We're not going to take, um, well, we do take max depth on the level A form, but this downstream control, this is basically the tail out of the plunge pool. And this is where a riffle break is, where you start to see the riffle and the little wave starting. Um, we don't need to uh, worry about downstream control other than getting the length of the pool. This downstream control does get more important at the level B. I won't go into that, but we take a cross section here to understand what the stream is doing in the hydrology. But on level A, there is a max depth and a pool length. One thing to remember is if there's a pipe and it goes right to a stream and there is no pool, no plunge pool, this is a plunge pool because the water's coming out, we have a water surface drop. When you take the length of a plunge pool, you're taking it from the end of the pipe. You're not taking it from here against the bank because that that's, you know, naturally you probably think you'd measure from here to the riffle crest or downstream control but we're interested in fish getting into this pipe and passing. So you're measuring from the end of the pipe to the downstream control. And the width is the same. You want to really look for that scour. It's going to be hard to get a good bank full width here as we know, but the level A form calls for a scour line width. So here we see a wetted width where the water is at this particular day, but we want to measure the actual scour width. So we understand at an average flow where the water would be 
or a higher flow rate rather where the water would be and how much the fish could actually leap. When we have um, the max depth, that's another thing to consider. A lot of times, especially in the summertime, the water is going to be way down here. It's going to be low. You might have a lot longer water surface drop, but your width could be a little bit skewed because you're not ma ma um, measuring the, the maximum scour line width. Again, I'm probably making it sound more complicated than it is, and this will make a lot more sense tomorrow. And the level A form on the front and back is really helpful. Photos, photos, photos. Um, when you take a photo, it's really nice, if you can, to see the top of the road prism. Some pipes might be down in a, you know, in a bit of a, a little ravine or a canyon, if you will, and the road's way up high. Um, if you can't get it, that's okay. Our road field depth metric will tell us that. But it's good to try to get a scene of the pipe. As you can see there, this one on the top right, there's a pipe in there, but you can't see much. Um, you can't always hack away and expose a whole pipe, but sometimes your partner can hold branches back. Um, you can try using a flash. That can help too. And uh, there's a selfie of Justin. He used to train everybody. So now we're going to go through the steps again. I'm going to collect level A data. Okay, here, this I'm going to go ahead and get through all this so we can kind of look at it for a minute. This, this is the decision tree I keep referring to. So we got a level A data. First thing, this is a hierarchy decision tree too. So you go one at a time. Is there a water surface drop greater than 0.24 meters? Yes, you have a barrier. Now, how much the water surface drop and how much of a barrier, we'll see on the next slide. Let's say there's not a water surface drop. So we're going down to countersunk. And you can see how important countersunk is. It's going to really split out which direction you go. And onward. I don't need to go through one at a time here. But this is laminated in our, in our clipboards, in our kits. And we'll be looking at this tomorrow a fair amount. This is my best friend. And I still have to reference it. I, I pretty much have it memorized by now. But I always pull it out because I don't want to miss anything. So this is another table. This is on the back side of that laminated sheet in our kit. So here you can go out tomorrow. And if we find a water surface drop, that's let's say it's 0.6 meters. You can know right away. If you look at the table, 0.6 meters is 33% passable. That's a really important information. If we don't have updated data or if this site has never been surveyed. So that's, that's the great thing about what we're all doing with this program is we can, um, we can either update data or really document barriers that maybe are completely undocumented. Now slope, you'll see it's important to note the length. That's the length of the culvert. And the longer the culvert is, the less um, ability the fish are to get all the way through it at steeper slopes. So that's why you'll see the thresholds for slope on a longer pipe over 18.3 meters are a lot more stringent. It goes right from 33 to zero. Really, really helpful. Multiple culvert crossings. This is important to remember too. Um, the barrier status is based on all three of these. And essentially, if you have one opening or one culvert that's passable, the whole site is passable. So let's just say you have a two culvert site, culvert 1.2 and 2.2. You measure 1.2 and you do your slope and all, and it's like, oh, this is a total barrier but then you measure the culvert 2.2 and it's passable. Nope, the site's not a barrier. So make sure we consider that. Um, there is this video on the bat site. This is a great refresher. It doesn't cover at all and it is a little bit outdated. Um, I'm gonna use my cursor if you can see this. This is the old decision tree. It's pretty similar, not as colorful, but I'm just really pointing out that um, this video is a little older and um, the level A form is a little bit different too, but I still recommend it um, in terms of a refresher and it's pretty darn short. You know, it looks like it's 13 minutes long. So a good idea if you, if you've got, we get trained up tomorrow and today and you know, you, you go out, but it's been a year or it's even been a month. Um, look up this video cause it's pretty concise and gives you um, a little reminder here. 
So the next um, slides get a little bit confusing because it's showing our laser level. This is a rotary laser level that we'll get familiar with tomorrow, if not already. This is the receiver that goes on top of a stadia rod. And you see they're measuring the invert here and measuring the invert here. We're gonna get the slope on this. Um, I don't need to over explain these because we're gonna get into this. There's four shot and back shot. Sometimes if there's visibility issues, you have to make, you have to move the laser. You might be only to be able to measure the downstream side, and then you're going to make a point you can see and move the laser so you can get in view of the upstream side. That can get a little confusing, but once you wrap your head around it, it's not too bad. The point with all that, what I'm saying now, is that when you set up your rotary laser, you want to really think about the visibility of the receivers, this, these yellow boxes on top of the rod that you're going to be carrying around. It set it up, the rotary laser, the tripod in a way, that's going to be advantageous that you hopefully don't have to move it. But if you do, there's a way, there's a way to do that. Um, these are the stadia rods or fiberglass. Um, we really want to take care of these. They're really, really tough, but a lot of times we're working with metal pipes and we're laying it against the pipe and stuff totally fine, but try not to scrape and rub these against the pipe because usually those that do that uh, pay the price because they get fiberglass on their hands. So take care of our stadia rods and remember their metric. So they're not going to be, you know, the one on the right standard goes in inches, see 10, 11, two feet, or the one on the right is in tenths. And they have these little marks, these little pointer arrows, and we can we can talk about that tomorrow. But that's how you're going to read off um, to the nearest um, to a hundredth of a meter. Yep, we're going to we have metric. That's what we're using. Um, we're not going to get the. I'm not really going to explain this too much. We're going to do this tomorrow. But we're setting up, I'm going to go to the next slide here. What we're doing is we're setting up our instrument. Here's a picture of the rotary laser. The laser actually rotates and spins, and there is a red laser that the receiver that Justin is holding here receives. And once you're right at that level, it will beep and tell you, yep, this is this is exactly level with that. So when I'm, we're out there doing it, I think of it as a, a plane, that rotary laser is throwing at a, a whole level plane of a laser. And we run around and make our steady rod longer and shorter to meet that plane. And when we hear the beep, we have an elevation to record. Again, we'll, it'll make a lot more sense tomorrow. I'm not even gonna get into this basic surveying. Hey Luke, real quick. Yep. Uh, I'm heading out, but I wanna let everyone know that I am gonna be sending out an email uh, once I get back. Um, with a whole bunch of resources that you can print out if you want to bring with you or it's something that you'll have for the future with FAQs and step-by-step -step walkthroughs and links to videos on how you can do stuff and we'll go over it all tomorrow and in the future but I'll be sending that out later tonight as well so enjoy the training I'll try and come back if I can make it back in time thanks Luke Th thanks Nick um, just real quick too I, I don't we're we're at level B here so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the level A form and we're going to walk through it and then I'm, I'm available for questions. We, we've done well here. Um, yep. That's all I had for you, Nick. Thank you. Perfect. And then also I'll mention with the, the resources uh, that we've referenced that Nick just referenced are great, but um, don't feel overwhelmed. You don't need to print anything out tonight. And in fact, I would just sit back, digest, and then maybe after tomorrow, um, that would be a great place to help solidify once you've gotten your hands on some of this equipment and we've done some surveys, um, some of the FAQs or some of that information might make more sense. I just want to be careful we don't overwhelm folks because um, it's going to be a lot more comfortable about this time tomorrow after we've, we've gotten into the stream and done some work. So um, th these slides keep going. Um, we're on slide 68 of 133. I think that once we um, get a little more practice and those um, willing and eager, we can get into level B training. I'd love to do that um, some more with folks. Luckily, most sites, not most, but some sites don't need level B. Level A is plenty and that's enough. But that decision tree, I'm gonna go back to that. Let's be patient, I'm gonna find it here. Here it is. Um, hopefully you're seeing barrier analysis level A. You see the yellow boxes here, proceed to level B. Those are the cases where we need to do a level B. And that's, oh man, sh shooting from the hip, loosely speaking, about a third of the sites, maybe half of the sites 
we'll, we'll, we'll say proceed to level B. So back to the um, level A form. Let's look at that again. Let me, let me get out of this so I can find my page easier. And, and um, I guess maybe I'll pause for a minute and we can talk about, actually, you know what I'm going to do? Um, I'm going to pull up the full screen level A. Let me pull up my own level A. So I'm going to stop sharing. And um, while I'm doing that, if anybody has questions, um, start, start shooting. I'm listening. No, no questions. I'm just, I'm just, we're just absorbing this stuff. I'm not good, good. It's, it, it, it's so hard too when um, we're doing it online and it's, it's, yeah, it's a lot. Okay, so I just got my form here. Make it bigger. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. You know, I, I do have a question. Um, is there any, aspect of trying to determine the the uh, condition of the culvert or the age of it any kind of just offhand sort of yeah i mean is yeah, that great. something you just note in your field notes or what exactly um that that's that's what i would recommend a lot of these culverts you'll see um and just just like our bridges and our dams there a lot of these are outdated it's right. old structure and they'll be corrupted Yes, so absolutely note that. I'm I'm often noting um, corrosion in the culvert, uh, rusted outlet. The bot, you know, water's escaping the culvert midway because of rust. Absolutely, it's a really good idea. The comments can be invaluable, especially when you we get a collection of culverts that we're looking at, and we're trying to decide which ones we're going to go back to or which ones we want to get a level B on. Those types of comments are really helpful to know. So that would be in the co comments section where you would note that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it would be. Um, can you, are you all seeing my level A form? Hmm. Okay, great. So um, I'm, I'm just, we're going to come right back to this, but I have a two page. So the back side looks like this. I'll zoom in. So it's a concise version. But if you weren't sure, let's just say number nine, cross-sectional shape of the culvert. You know, you may not have R-N-D or E-L-L memorized, but here it will tell you elliptical, round, et cetera. And if you don't remember what elliptical means, we also have in the little clipboard, which you may never need to pull out, there is an expansion of this level A form instructions it, instead of a single page and this concise, it's about three pages. So there's not too much information in our little field kit clipboard, but there is enough that um, after tomorrow, you could really go do this on your own for, for most folks. Um, so anyway, just showing you the backside, but let's really go through, let's do a hypothetical here. And um, I'm not gonna put any in here, but we're just gonna walk through. So crew, right? That's, that's the folks that's doing this. It is important that you put your name on here so that if there's questions, if Nick has questions, um, we can circle back and say, hey, you noted, you know, let's say it's culvert is corroded, um, but it's also a precast concrete culvert. Did you mean corroded like metal or did you mean like it has an issue with the concrete breaking apart or something? You know, it's just it's just good to have the source of information. Um, you know, most of this is uh, pretty self-explanatory culvert number. That is 1.1, for example, if it's one culvert. But if there's three culverts, you're going to have three of these data sheets. So there is one data sheet per culvert. So again, if it's site ID, we have three culverts, you're going to be the same site ID because that's the barrier site. But then you're going to have culvert 1.3, 2.3, and 3.3. Um, culvert description, right? Material, PCC. Precast concrete. This is good practice for me. <laughs> CPC, CST, SST. So that's number five. Flip your page over. Let's see what number five says here. Yep. 
pretty pretty clear on that. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Most what you're going to see is going to be precast concrete, corrugated steel, or corrugated aluminum. On big pipes, we will see some structural plate steel or aluminum. And then on real small streams or non-fish streams, there's more plastic. You often don't see plastic as much anymore. Okay, so we got material. We got the span. That's across, right? The diameter across. We got the rise. And remember, um, these are very important measurements, uh, particularly when it comes to um, the the level B part, when it comes to velocity and depth, these measurements are really important. Um, the water depth in the culvert, we have little tape measures in our field kits and they're metric. And uh, you generally want to measure the water depth to the zero. Uh, well, we'll do that tomorrow, but that six inches in from the outlet. Um, we got the shape, WS drop, water surface drop. And uh, remember that table had the criteria or the, the thresholds for water surface drop. So at the bottom, we actually get to assign a passability to this and that that will come into play potentially. And you'll see drop location, you know, outlet, inlet, interior. This is just darn helpful for um, reminding us to look for water surface drop throughout, not just at the outlet. Uh, the apron, I'm almost always saying none, as I mentioned, but absolutely consider an apron. And again, that's different than a beveled end. If I have a beveled culvert, I will note that, and the pictures will show that, but I'll note that here. In the com I'll show you, there's comments right here. Um, something else that we're gonna talk about once I get here is this, there's a lot of white space on this form. And when I get, first got trained, I printed my forms out and I, I expanded them so they were bigger, but I lost the white space. And what I do, some of my calculations, um, I like this white space. So then you would literally have your math recorded on the data sheet. So if there is a mistake, you can see right here what I did. So you'll, so let's say we got, we're going to keep moving apron. We've got the length of the culvert we, we, to get that. We have laser um, distance measures, basically range finders. They're optical. You can look through them and hit a target on the other end. And essentially your survey partner will hold a target for you and you can get a distance. Um, but the slope is a place where I like to do the math on the sides and rise over run is the trick here. So we'll have our, so it's right now we have a length and then we're going to have to give our inverts. Now there's no place here to get our invert elevations. Remember the inverts, the inside bottom of the pipe in stream and depth, upstream and downstream. So what I do is on this left side, I actually put U S upstream, INV invert, and I'll put a number, whatever it is, whatever, when we measure that steady rod, and then I'll put DS invert and another number. And essentially subtracting those two will give you your rise. And some of that materials that, that, that Nick is talking about, um, and our, I'm sorry, I don't want to go on that tangent. We'll, we'll talk about this. Um, but just, just something to think about when we're trying to figure out a couple of these metrics in particular culvert slope. And we're about to get to that, this number 22, the culvert span bank full width. That is literally one division problem. You're going to take the span of the culvert and divide it by your bank full width. That's going to give you a ratio. And that was one of the decision tree points. Is your culvert span bank full width greater than 0.75? What that means is your culvert too small for the stream. And if it's more than 25 or 75%, then you're going to have to get more information, which would be a level B. Um, not, not, you guys don't have to have that down now, but, um, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to the span bank full width. Let's go back to where we were on culvert slope, rise over run the road fill depth. Again, this one's only to the nearest meter. So we can, we can be a little loose on that estimation countersunk. This is a really important one just as important as um, there's probably about five things on here. You know, the actual sh um, span of the culvert and rise of the culvert, um, the slope of the culvert, but countersunk is really one of those in the decision tree. So if we remember countersunk, remember that image, 20% of fill at the outlet, 
and sediment throughout. Backwatered, I'm curious, um, I wanna look at the definition on the back now. Um, gate, that's like that tide gate or head gate. Um, generally, anything that we're surveying is gonna say no. A rack, you know, they can be all kinds of racks. The most important thing is if it's a rack right up against the pipe that would keep fish from getting through the pipe, then we start measuring. Um, there is no place to really me uh, to, to record the rack measurements here. So you're almost always going to say no, but if you have a rack, again, you have space over here to say rack dimensions or what have you, what your, what your measurement might be. Fishway, yes, no. And then channel description. So, you know, we talked a lot about bank full width. Um, we talked about this uh, span bank full width ratio, and that'll make a lot more sense tomorrow. I will mention on the span bank full width, if you have a, a site with more than one culvert, um, you need to add the span of all the culverts. And again, what it's trying to get at is the stream has a width of this wide. Is Are these culverts, and it could be plural, wide enough to carry the stream through it? So when you do that, you got to make sure you add the span of each culvert at that site before you do that, um, that division. Tidal influence, most likely no. Um, plunge pool description. So sometimes if there's no plunge pool, essentially, if there's no water surface drop, there's not likely a plunge pool. You don't need to worry about that. I always take a scour line width, this pool scour line width. I generally take one um, near the outlet anyway, but it doesn't mean anything unless there is a true plunge pool. Um, another thing too is, excuse me, sometimes there'll be that scour pool at an outlet. If you remember the image early or earlier today, it, it showed the sediment building up at the head. It was like a little cartoon. There's a sediment wedge and the outlet showed a, a pool of water. Um, technically that's not a plunge pool, but you could note that um, here. You, you could just say um, scour pool instead of plunge pool. But technically speaking, if there's not a plunge pool, you can, you can actually skip that whole section, these three, number 24, 25, and 26. So you got all this information. Now we get to do barrier status. And we'll go back to the table and we can identify this. So um, there's method level A, level B, fishway. I'm going to go look at the table that showed the barrier of passability in a minute. Um, here's the percent passability. And then significant reach. Now, I, this is what I want to get to before I look at the table. I'm going to go down and look at number 30. Significant reach is in the protocol. When in doubt, say unknown. But significant reach is essentially, it if you can read number 30, hopefully it's big enough for you all. Make a, whoop, that's a little bit grainy. Let's scoot over here. So here's number 30, indicates whether there's a 200 linear meters of potential fish habitat upstream and downstream of the culvert. And we are not needing to go 200 meters upstream and downstream of the culvert to confirm this. Um, this is based on some of that physical criteria uh, we were looking at in terms of fish use. Um, again, when in doubt, say unknown. If you're on a stream that you know has salmon, and there are salmon that pass through this area, like you're not way too high in the watershed or something. If you have personal knowledge about the site, by all means say fish use potential, yes. I know this stream has salmon and I know that they travel through here. Um, or excuse me, significant reach. But again, when in doubt, mark this one unknown because we can identify that later or we can we can use some of that desktop analysis, that, that, that fish documentation and the maps that we talked about. So uh, before I go to the table, we can look at the thresholds if we want one more time. And that table again was the thresholds for water surface drop and where it becomes a barrier and what percent passability. And then the other thing on there was the slope. At what point does a slope trigger it as a barrier and to what percentage? But before I, yeah, I don't know if we need to look at that, but um, that's kind of what I have here. Uh, any, any questions, well, let, let's have a discussion because that's pretty much what we have for today. So the big deal you're talking about the counter sunk measurement is uh, run that run over that again. Yeah, that's that's a really good visual to have. Um, let me let me let me get out of yeah. 
Let's stop presenting. Okay, let me find this here. Yeah, that visual, some of the in my head, um, I really appreciate the cartoons. Uh, here it is. Okay, pull up my screen. Okay, I think you guys, can you see that full screen? Yes. So it can be deceiving, especially with this bottom one. If you can't see into the pipe and you can't, it's too small to, you know, kind of get in there and walk or anything. Um, you might not know if there's no sediment in the middle. You see it at the inlet and the outlet. And again, the 20% is 20% of the rise of the pipe. So if you have sediment at the outlet and at the inlet, and you're trying to figure out if it's 20% or not, you really try, you really need to get the gravel probe and find the bottom of the pipe. There's definitely times when you can't find the bottom of the pipe, particularly if the stream is really embedded, meaning it, it is hard to get through the sediment. It's big co cobbles and you literally can't penetrate through it. Um, you could try to look at old site reports if it's been surveyed before, which will tell you if it's round or an arch, um, whether it has a bottom or not, essentially. Um, and there are times when I have done, I don't know if you can see my cursor, I'm going to go to the second one down, or says no. Um, let's say we can't find the bottom of this pipe, but we do have a span across. We know what a diameter is across. And if we go to the inlet, we can actually get the rise at the inlet because there's no sediment. So we know it's not countersunk, so we don't really need to work too hard. But let's just pretend we're on the third one down. And we can get to the bottom of the pipe on the upstream end. But we really want to know is it 20% at the downstream end. We may have to use the rise that we measure at the inlet, assuming it's the same pipe. And it's not retrofitted with a different material at one end versus the other. Sometimes you got to get creative to get the rise, and then you can almost subtract. If you can't get to the bottom on the outlet, can you see my cursor here? You can actually measure from the soffit to the gravel, and then assume that the bottom of the pipe is that much more under the gravel. Is that making sense? Sometimes you have to get creative and, and figure out a way to estimate how much sediment is in the pipe to then identify is it 20% or not. That making sense? I'm not getting the uh, the numbers you use to come up with a twenty percent. What what that's that's a yeah. So um, let's let's just let's try to do this. So uh, let's do a yes. So let let's say we can probe no problem. Okay, let's say we can reach the bottom. We're going to be on this third pipe down. We have a gravel probe and. Um, our gravel probes are generally four feet tall, but on site, when you're doing this, you take your tape part, they're four feet, but we need meters. So you're going to measure the meters of the gravel probe. And you're going to work down through the sediment. And when you do hit the bottom of a pipe, whether it's concrete or metal, you know it. I mean, I should say, you know, it. Um, sometimes you can get on a rock and you, it feels really solid, but when you hit the bottom of a, a culvert, it's kind of, uh, vibrates. It definitely makes that sound. Um, and we could do that tomorrow. Hopefully we have a countersunk one, but let's just say we find the bottom of the pipe and then it's, it's, and the pipe is big enough that there's more room on top of the probe where you're going to measure up from the handle to the soffit. So you're going to add the length of the probe to the length you measured. So you have your rise. Does that make sense so far? I think so. Yeah. And again, when we get our hands on these tools and we're standing there, even if there is no sediment in the pipe we're standing at tomorrow, we can pretend and, and figure it out and start measuring. But to get the actual sediment depth, how much depth is the sediment in the pipe, you can probe down and assume you can 
find the bottom of that pipe and you'll see me all pro down and kunk, kunk, kunk. I really want to confirm and I kind of bang it down. Um, I will just grab with my hand and I'll kind of pinch the probe at the top of the surface and I'll pull it out and I'll measure that. That part that was penetrated through the gravel that did reach the, the bottom of the pipe. And that's the amount of sediment. So let's just say that's half a meter and you have a three meter pipe, you know, that's going to be one sixth. What is one sixth? That's 20%. So one, five, six. 16%. Oh, it's not 20%. Yeah, 16.6 .6 repeating, almost 17%. So that's not countersunk, hypothetically, right? I mean, that, that's an example, but let's let's do that. We'll definitely, the nice thing is that this is just kind of priming you all up for tomorrow. You know, um, we're going to set up the laser level and we're going to think about visibility of the upstream of the pipe versus the downstream of the pipe. And then once we're set up, we'll be taking measurements and we're recording some of this stuff and we'll come to countersunk. And even if it's not a countersunk pipe, we're going to pretend like it is and we're going to talk through that metric as we're doing it. Um, and like anything, every pipe is different. Um, I, I'm, I'm proud to share. Um, I Again, I, <laughs> I love my job. And we got a project to do an inventory on the Western OP on county roads. And I got to walk every mile of Western Jefferson and Clallam County roads. And we surveyed over 650 pipes. And I still go to sites now where I, every once in a while, I'm scratching my head. Like, what do we do here? You know, and you just do the best you can. Um, we're trying to put a very black and white quantifiable protocol into something that is not always consistent. So um, don't get discouraged by any means if you run into something after tomorrow. And even after you've been surveying 30 pipes, you're going to find places where you're going to scratch your head a little bit. Obviously, when you're on site and you spent your Saturday or you spent the time to get there, you don't want to like not come home with something valuable. So again, I mean, pictures, uh, photographs, that is, notes, even little sketches of what you're seeing at the site can be really helpful. And I have also, in sharing this story, I have brought some challenges to dfw i have been on site and i had cell phone coverage and i i called luckily i have a direct line to the manager at dfw for the fish passes program and he was stumped and i i facetimed him and i showed him and he said let me think about that um and he said do this so he basically told me to do both i did two different routes on the decision tree you know um yeah, it, it's it's um it's it's fun because you don't know what you're going to find at each site. But hopefully, you know, after tomorrow, you're familiar with your equipment. You're familiar with some of the thresholds and and um and just some of the minor math. You know, the only real math is the slope that rise over run we can practice, and also um that bankful the span bankful width ratio. Um, but there's you don't we need to do much for calculations. There's a couple tricks um, that we'll talk about tomorrow. Our laser range finders, um, a bit of a mistake, but they're not metric. So that's one other calculation is that we just need to do a quick, um, what's the word? Conversion. A unit conversion from, from feet to meters. Um, and that's fine. You know, it's one one extra thing. But, um, yeah. Any other, any other questions or like, what other slides would you guys like to see again? And, and by the way, this whole slide deck is on the bat site too. So it's in a PDF format. So you can just slide through. And if you want to see any visuals down the line, it is available. Patrick's on mute, but he's talking. Who's on, who's on mute? I thought Patrick was, but it... I look, I look, it doesn't look like he's on mute. But he's, I, just saw, I just saw his picture on. He raised his hand like he wanted to ask a question, and then he... <laughs> Yeah. 
Um, Steve, you, you've, you've been through all this. Um, any, any points you'd, you'd like to kind of highlight or from your perspective? Uh, sure. Um, and then, by, by necessity, we have to cover all this material. Um, uh, we, we've got an arrangement with the Department of Fish and Wildlife so that we, basically they've kind of deputized us to, to um, do our own training here. And my experience has been that uh, there's a tendency on the part of people when they get first exposed to the whole thing to get kind of overwhelmed because uh, there's so much stuff in there and there's some jargon and whatnot. I, I really would encourage everybody not to worry about it. Um, it you, you will see... Uh, when you start doing it, what the, how this all fits together. And I really would encourage you, don't get discouraged um, by all of this stuff. It, it does drop into place. When to, literally, um, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen a situation where uh, people didn't, you know, at some point the, the, the understanding of what's, what we're talking about uh, comes into play. So don't, don't get too uh, wrapped around the axles of all this stuff. That, that is... Perfect, Steve. I, I cannot read. I've been trying to reiterate that. And, you know, yes. In fact, I think I think you're making the point that we are kind of required to go through some of this. Mm -hmm. this one. And I think if um, we didn't have that requirement, we could actually end up, we could go straight in the field and it would skip over a lot of this overwhelming and a little bit of confusion. Um, in terms of tomorrow, I, I would not be worried about preparing anything. I wouldn't be worried about looking at this again online. Um, if nothing else, you know, you could go onto the DFW barrier website and their map and find that wildcat lake and click on a couple of the dots because we're going to end up at one or two of those tomorrow. And you'll see their, um, their data, their level A form and stuff just for curiosity. But really we could, you know, in, in terms of your understanding and getting trained, this is a formality and the real, the real stuff where the dots get connected is tomorrow. I just had a question for tomorrow. I, I, I don't wear, don't want to wear my four hundred dollar waders tomorrow. I have hip boots that I don't mind walking through blackberries and you know damaging those, but. Uh, so, you know, the hip boots will be adequate for tomorrow? Uh, I can answer that. Yeah, the uh, hip boots will be fine. We won't be burying ourselves in water. The streams are not that large. Okay. I would also add that uh, I've actually decided the hip boots are better in some ways because they're more resistant to all the blackberries. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the only downside of hip, uh, uh, hip boots is that you can't kneel. In the in the in the stream, and sometimes it, it helps if you can kneel so you can see through the culvert. Um, and the other part, the other downside is if you take a tumble, which I've done, your 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 hip boots do fill up with water, which is <laughs> gonna be an issue. But I still I still prefer them for a lot of cases. I I, um, I do tomorrow. You're probably fine. I'm just looking at the weather real quick. I haven't done that yet, but it looks like we got good weather. One thing to consider in the future, if it's raining. You're gonna, right. You can have your hip boots on and your raincoat, but then the raincoat just funnels the rain into your hip boots in some ways. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, we also um, have a machete in our in our kit. Sometimes, you know, if you're really ambitious or, or maybe you don't have a choice, you got to hack away at some blackberries to get to the pipe. So I actually carry, um, I don't, our kits do not have gloves. That's a personal thing, but you might want to bring some gloves. You can bring the uh, the rubber palmed ones or leather gloves or something. But if, if, if you got kind of a nasty site, that's kind of a nice thing to have. I always wear my gloves if I'm going to use the machete just for protection, um, not because of the blade, but hacking away at thorns, you can get them right on your knuckles and stuff. Um, otherwise, yeah, for equipment tomorrow, that's a good point. I, I think gloves and yeah, waders or hip boots. Any other equipment that's really handy, Steve, that is not in our what? kits? Um, no, if, um, so if you have access and get a, a pair of, uh, like pruning shears, 
Spring shears can sometimes be faster and easier than the machete. Uh, you can just kind of selectively clip away at a couple of, of major things here and there, and it's, it can, can be faster. So I've just added a pair to my kit. Another thing, just for fun, to kind of, um, I don't, I don't really like being um, tooting my horn. Or, I'm not a spotlight guy by any means, but it invigorates me sometimes to remember what this is all about. And uh, Wild Salmon Center, one of our project partners, uh, put out a short film, about six minute film. It's almost two years ago now, maybe last year, um, but it's called Cold Water Connection. If you just Google cold water connection salmon, there's a little film and there's a little bit of me and to you in there, but it really brings home the whole point with all this work and it does make a difference. It, it, get, it gets me um, inspired every time I see it. If I get kind of bogged down in work and get in all my data, I, I can look at that and be like, yeah, that's why we're doing all this. So it's kind of fun. Jim, did you have any last thoughts? Um, I will say that the uh, the restrooms are at the uh, state or the county park, Longcat Lake County Park. Um, the county assures me that they are open now as of April 1st, um, but that's the only facility we'll have available other than, and, and the property around where we're working is all private. A uh, number of residences. There is some undeveloped land, so you might be able to find a bush somewhere, but um, that is private and posted for no trespassing. And there are blackberries where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> I will share, um, just since we're kind of having a casual conversation here with a little bit of extra time, that um, we have a new Trout Unlimited staff that um, to, this is her second week. Her name is Alex. She is going to join us tomorrow. Um, she is the Chehalis project manager, our new Chehalis Basin project manager, um, which I'm very excited about. It's, it's, she's going to be working under me, but I've been um, focusing on the Western Olympic Peninsula as I'm supposed to do, but there's so much happening in the Chehalis. We got this new staff person. So um, she's not here today. She's gotten some training from me and from some of the resources I've sent her, but she's going to be learning a lot tomorrow too. So you all get to meet Alex. I actually get to meet her for the first time. Um, we, we went through many interviews and we've been working, you know, remotely together, but um, expect to see Alex and she does not need to be front and center. Um, she can get whatever needed training later she needs to, but she was excited to come out and kind of see this and meet some of the grassroots. So. Okay, well, that's, I mean, I, any other thoughts, gang, before we get together tomorrow? Patrick, go ahead. Go ahead. So I see Patrick's question about a Prius handling the road. No problem. It's all paved roads we'll be on. So, um, just let, me, let me add one thing. Um, as far as directions, if you're looking up uh, directions from uh, maps to get to Wildcat Lake County Park, there's a lot of road construction on uh, the road Bremerton Seebeck Highway between Silverdale and the uh, Holly Road, which is where the park is. So, the better way to come. To avoid delays i've been on it a few times and the delays have been minimal but but there's about a mile and a half of construction and uh, being saturday it may be okay but just be prepared so if you're coming from the north give it a couple extra minutes
Okay. How are we doing? Good. Good, good. Again, this is going to make a lot more sense tomorrow. Okay. Well, I, I'm not really in charge here, so. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, Thank you, you want to appreciate you? your time, and uh, I think it was a good, uh, good demonstration or discussion of the uh, information. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to meeting all of you and some of seeing some of you again. Um, we'll see you in the morning.